Welcome to episode 61 of the Positive on Publishing podcast. This podcast aims to inspire you with information to allow you to pursue your creative life with a smile on your face. I'm your host, Catherine Guiley. Learn more about my work at makeeverythingfun.com. My guest today is Dr. Jason Saunders. Dr. Saunders can be best described as an educator, author, and doctor. Dr. Saunders, I wanted you to talk a little bit about that subtitle, educator, author, and doctor. And then we'll get started. I'll tell the audience a little bit more about your background. But as a, as a subtitle, let's talk a little bit more about that. So, you mean my background as far as those things go? Yeah. So very few doctors would describe themselves as an educator and an author and a doctor. So when you look at your resume, your CV, tell us a little bit more about how you came up with that subtitle. So, you know, ultimately we don't, we don't really think about it this way necessarily, but uh, doctor means teacher. And so, uh, you know, I got into healing because my interest obviously in, you know, the human body, physiology, anatomy, uh, and then all the different things that we can do, not just to get better once we get sick, but really to, you know, prevent or um, optimize ourselves, even as a way to just not get sick in the first place. So um, one of my mentors used to always say, you know, that was one of his things, you know, doctor means teacher, and it's your responsibility not to have patients rely on you know, you specifically for the therapy. It's not you, the doctor who heals, it's the patient that heals. It's, you know, it's my job to help educate people to understand what they could do to help heal themselves. And so um, I guess that's a big part of where, you know, doctor and educator come, come together. And then, you know, throughout my practice life, I've been in practice for about 16 years. There are certain things that I've noticed that uh, either I repeat over and over and over again, or ideas that are just somehow, you know, vastly missed by the average doctor or even uh, patient. And so those are the things that I tend to write about because, you know, I, it, it's, it, it's fine for me one-on-one -on -one when I'm with a patient to explain these concepts and I'm always happy to do that. And at the same time, if I'm having to repeat that over and over again, one-on-one -on -one in a room with a patient, you know, the idea that there's probably a lot more people out there that have the same questions or same issues you know, that if I could share those messages on a broader scale, you know, maybe I could help impact more people that way. And so that's, that's where the author, I guess, came, came out of. And Dr. Jason, I think it's really important that I stop right there and didn't actually go through the whole bio. I will, but I want to just emphasize that to listeners is that I think we get, when we go into our doctor's offices, and I am guilty of this as well, I sort of get into the situation where, you know, he or she is on a pedestal and they have the answers and I'm just this like person that's supposed to listen and I probably only have 15 minutes if I'm in the conventional um, you know, traditional medical system. And you write a lot about that in your book about how the, the traditional or conventional system can be broken because it's just all about you know, following a quick process and, and saying like, this is what you have to do and there's only a little bit of time. And so that person needs to walk out and then go like, what just happened? But Doctor as educator, like let's really um, allow that to land with the listeners so that potentially we're going to create a shift in how people think about their relationship with their doctors. And maybe the doctors listening to this podcast as well can say, wait a minute, I have a bigger role than just um, telling people, you know, what to do, but to actually educate them. And, you know, I believe it's important for people to feel empowered and, and through education, there's empowerment. And then maybe there's even some choice. And once you have choice, then you really have commitment and follow through. And that really is what leads to optimal wellness. So, um, so thank you for describing that. I mean, anything else on that idea of doctor as, as teacher, as educator, and, and then I'll kind of get into more about your background and your, your practice. I think exactly, you know, exactly what you just said. The idea that, um, <clears throat> you know, a patient might come to me and, you know, I, I magically have some solution and I, you know, command them to, to do this thing or that we're going to do this procedure. You know, doctors get paid by procedure, unfortunately, not outcome. You know, if doctors were, and, and I, I would say this for myself too, you know, if, if we were actually paid for our outcome versus just paid for our procedures, you know, the likelihood that we would take the time to really help patients understand the importance of their role in that process 
I think that would change dramatically. And I think that that's really what you said about choice. You know, I don't tell patients, you know, hey, you have to do this. I say, you're coming to me with a series of questions. I will happily answer those questions. And at the end, there's probably more than one way to get there. And so once we know what the issues are and where we we're trying to go, you know, we'll present you with a few options. You get to pick your route. You know, my, got, my job is to guide you, not to, you know, drag you kicking and screaming. So, you know, here's your path. And uh, here's a few different ways you can get there. Which way do you feel the most comfortable with? I think that's critical for um, helping patients truly get to a, a different place in their health. Uh, Dr. Jason, I don't think I've ever had a fun nugget or set of fun nuggets when I haven't even gotten through the um, the introduction, but this is really cool. I'm just going to pull out two quick ones really quick. So um, number one fun nugget is that doctors are educators, not commanders. That was a word that you used, that I think is really important because I think we go in and we're like, you know, what do you tell me I need to do? Um, but the, but it kind of leads to the second fun nugget, which is that doctors and their patients are co-creators of the outcomes. And you talked about how, you know, there's, there's not only just a set way of, you know, the flow chart, which I always think of as like the AMA, you know, the American Medical Association has these flow charts and then doctors um, feel that if they deviate from those, you know, this box leads to this box, there's potential liability. But if the patients and the doctors are working as a team to co-create the decisions and outcomes, then we have a higher like a likelihood of of health and wellness and pain free lives. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So I'm going to just tell everyone a little bit more about you practice. So you are one of the doctors at Core Therapies, and you primarily are function um, focused on fun functional medicine and taking on complex cases, including autoimmune immune conditions, chronic inflammation, and neurological dysfunction. Oh my gosh, Dr. Jason, like. Um, I love functional medicine. I love, you know, looking at complex cases and coming up with, um, you know, with complex uh, solutions, right? Because the human system, and this is so funny how we're just diverting from the bio and we'll get back to it. Human beings are not, um, they don't fit into a flow chart, do they? Right? I mean, it's not very difficult to take this magnificent creature that we are and try to say, okay, we're going to say that you're this and then you need to go there. Moving beyond that, there's complexity, right? Which maybe is like, okay, we're going to take an algorithm and we're going to like put that into an algorithm and then, you know, then out, out comes a, a solution. But human beings, it's beyond complicated and moves into complex. And so there's all these systems. And so I'm going to just, I'm going to jump to something in your book that I was reading last night and I'm like, sure. oh my gosh, this is so great. First of all, I don't know how you have time to do all the things that you do and write. Um, I'm just going to finish the bio part and we're going to jump okay. right into the complex systems piece of things. Um, Dr. Jason has also published several guidebooks. So you, in, in addition to your, your practice and you're the founder of a company, we're going to be talking about hyperbaric oxygen solutions today. Um, but you also have written guidebooks on neurological disease, functional medicine, nutrition, and this latest book, which we're going to be diving into is Oxygen Under Pressure using hyperbaric oxygen to restore health, reduce inflammation and re reduce, uh, reverse aging and revolutionize healthcare. So um, in this book, you talk, this was the first time I've ever actually seen this in print, Dr. Jason, and maybe it's out there and I just, it landed for me in your book. And that is the idea, I don't think you use the word stacking in the book, but that is the idea. This was the whole plant story about okay. how you, know, you can put a plant in the closet and then think that it's the lack of sunlight or the lack of water um, or lack of nutrient. And then you can try to do things one by one. But the actual answer is a complex system for that plant. Would you yeah. tell that story to listeners? Because I think it's, and then they, they can get the book and read the story in the book and all the context around it. But it's such a great metaphor for health. Sure. Yeah, I, and I tell that story a couple different ways. So maybe the shorter version of that story is just that, you know, oftentimes I may have a patient who comes in and they say, well, listen, you know, I know I have this chronic illness. And so somebody once told me I should be gluten-free. And so I tried that for three weeks. It didn't seem to do anything. So I put that back and then I tried dairy. So I took dairy out for a little while and I tried that for three weeks and, you know, I felt a little bit better, but then it wasn't really that much. So I put dairy back. 
you know, and then I started uh, taking these supplements and these supplements seemed to help a little bit, but it wasn't enough. So I stopped and then I started exercise, you know, so, and, and while all those things could be very good, that's what takes us to this plant, right? So if we have a plant and the plant is unhealthy, it shows us through certain signs and symptoms. So it starts to wilt, it starts to, you know, turn brown, uh, it stops growing or it stops flowering. And we have this idea about this plant that we know there are certain necessities uh, that a plant requires. And, but if we take it too literally and we take that to the way we view human health through traditional medicine, you know, there's this need to be so specific and only change one variable at a time. And that becomes problematic because in that wilting plant, we, we know what the requirements are for the plant, but if we do it one at a time, the experiment, the way I describe it in the book, the experiment looks like, okay, well, we have to control variables. So we have this wilting, dry, brown, non-flowering plant. And so we need to know what's making this thing sick. And so if we control each variable, we have to say, okay, here's a dry wilting plant. We're not going to give it any nutrients. We're not going to give it any water. We're just going to stick it in the sunlight for two weeks and see what happens. And you could imagine if you take a dry wilting plant and you stick it in the sun for two weeks, it's going to get drier and probably crispier, right? So after two weeks, you look and say, well, gee, sunlight didn't help. So it can't possibly be that. It actually, in fact, the plant looks sicker after two weeks of sunlight only. So we take it out of the sunlight, we stick it in a closet to make sure it doesn't get any light because we have to control for the variables and we start watering it. And we know that the plant needed sun and we know that the plant needs water, but if you take a plant out of the sun and put it in a closet and start watering it, yes, the soil will become more moist, but the plant can't possibly express health without the sunlight also. And so I go on through a few phases like that in the book, but the, the end of the story is really just to say, listen, we know that that plant needs water, it needs nutrients, it needs healthy, clean soil, and it needs sunlight. And unless it gets all of those things for some period of time, that's the only way it could possibly express its health. And so when we have a human who's expressing certain symptoms of health, we can't always just say, well, I, I want to make sure because I need to know exactly which one of these things is going to influence our health. And so we're only going to do this and then we're only going to do that. It's the synergy. And it's almost always this case that I have found, especially with chronic illness, is that until you find the right combination and just like plants, humans have some basic necessities. You know, if we're toxic, we have to deal with that. If we're not getting the right nutrients, we need to deal with that. And so, you know, we, we look at, at patients through a lens of, of that, you know, toxicity and deficiency. So like in that plant, they might be deficient in sunlight, deficient in water, uh, and, and the soil could be toxic. Well, the same thing for us. We could be exposed to toxicities in our environment. We could be deficient in certain nutrients in our life or, or having the proper food. And so if the fuel isn't right and the, you know, the, the overall environment inside of our body is challenged until we start dealing with all of these facets simultaneously for some period of time, that's the only way we're ever going to really shift somebody's health the way we're trying to. And I'm going to push back on that. I, I agree okay. with you, um, but I'm going to push back on that. And sure. I'm going to have you kind of talk to this point. I'm going to first summarize, and that's that human beings are these complex systems that are going to require the adjustment of numerous variables in order for us to achieve optimal wellness, right? So, but the thing is, Dr. Jason, is that we know about a plant. We know that it needs the sunlight. We know that it needs the nutrients and we know that it needs the water. And when a person is like that plant, it's dry, it's, it's wilted, it's dying, um, we don't necessarily always know um, what is the issue. So my pushback to you is, you know, coming, from, I come from a, a, you know, lineage of scientists, right? And it's all about, you know, isolation of those variables so that you know it was the water, right? But I, I understand your an analogy. I'm just saying for the listener, you know, that goes and sees a functional medicine practitioner or or go, comes to see you and we're going to be talking about the synergies and stacking of different therapies and mm -hmm. going through some case um, examples of how the synergistic approach works. But to push back, if I'm a, a patient that says, oh my gosh, I need to add this and this and this, then how do I know what it is that I changed that allowed me to get better? 
Good question. And I think sometimes we won't know which exact one it was. And if you're getting the result that you're seeking, I don't know that I always care. But also, it's, it's likely that it isn't just the one. In other words, you know, uh, and I guess, you know, we can get to cases later, but um, if, if you do the right testing, and the right testing is really basically just asking the right questions. So if you're asking the right questions of the body in order to understand where the issues lie, and I don't believe that having an understanding of pathology, like disease, is as important as having a really strong understanding of physiology, normal, healthy function. Because when we understand physiology, pathology becomes extraordinarily obvious and the reasons for pathology become pretty obvious because they're deviations from normal function. So we spent so much time in traditional medicine dissecting pathology, which I also think is important and it allows us to understand disease processes. So I'm not trying to take away from that as much as I'm just saying that when you could focus on physiology and what a normal, healthy human should be functioning like and understanding the deviations from that, you can start to say, okay, well, here's, here's 15 symptoms that a patient may have. Of those 15 symptoms, here's three systems or four systems that are being impacted. Out of four systems that are being impacted, here's two really critical uh, common denominators in their pattern. We're going to focus on those two, because if we focus on those two common denominators, then those four systems get impacted, and then those 15 symptoms get impacted, and we start to see that plant, that person, expressing you know, a level of health. And we're not finished at that point. You know, that might just be the beginning, but we start you know, the whole idea of the layers. You know, most of us have numerous layers you know, that have that you know, combine to give us the health that we're expressing in this moment. And so we're just looking at what are the biggest impacts that we could have uh, initially, get those layers peeling back a little bit. Okay, now what's the next layer and peel that, you know, and, and kind of build it like that. Well, I love that. And I think that, you know, optimal medicine as we, and you can, everyone can read um, Dr. Jason's book and get a sense of the difference between, uh, you know, traditional medicine and optimal medicine. Um, but optimal medicine is about focusing, um, you said physiology, but I'm going to say it's also about focusing on performance over pathology. So rather right. than, you know, saying like, what's wrong with you? And these are all the symptoms and the diseases. It's about like, okay, well, like, how do we want to live lives fully and, and be active and, you know, be pain free and all that. So right. um, I think that's just a mindset shift for people listening that want to, you know, to try out something different as opposed to going to you know traditional medicine doctor and being told, that, you know, this is the code that defines you that's wrong with right. you. Um, so right. I would take that one step further. I'd say there are people out there who, unfortunately, have already crossed, you know, some imaginary line where now they're expressing some type of illness. So for those folks, you know, we could still, using the same principles I was just describing, we could still, you know, put a plan together to, to, to help pull them away from that, that system and get them at least back to some relative neutrality in their health. Uh, and then push that even further along if, if they're wanting that. For the rest of us, it's, you know, if you think of the way we do things traditionally right now, we basically go to the doctor every year, we get very, very minimal physical, and we get a very, very minimal amount of blood work. It seems to shrink each year. Um, and then, you know, we're basically like, okay, it looks like you're probably going to live another year. It's not, it's, there's, there's no, there's no active steps to take on any regular basis to instruct somebody how to improve their health, improve their life, build on those principles, you know, optimize. That's not a word that's really being used at all in, in traditional medicine. It's kind of like, all right, well, your, your glucose levels are a little high. Be careful. See you next year. Up, oh, your glucose levels got a little higher. Be careful. See you next year. Up, oh, you have diabetes. You know, like that could have been stopped, you know, years, probably a decade sooner if, if there was some degree of interest in 
optimization and increasing performance to your point. You know, if, if, if we're just gonna sit around passively waiting to get sick and then intervene at that point, you know, we'll, we'll be stuck in this model for a long time. If we understand that as we are on this planet, things go awry and it's our job to be active participants in our healthcare and there could be a plan in place to improve that over time, then five years from now, I could be, you know, exceptionally healthier than I am right now versus just waiting for my, you know, my systems to start breaking down and then, you know, become medicated because, you know, we waited too long. Mm, right. And so, so it's imp- so important for people to be proactive yeah. and to understand, and this is where, where I'm hoping to kind of flow into because your book goes through this story of inflammation and the importance of mitochondrial function. So I want to kind of go through those areas and get into the, the role of, of mitochondria at some point, maybe get into a, a case study, um, maybe even talking about a, a, a patient of yours, obviously keeping confidentiality and all that, but uh, maybe like autoimmune disease is such a huge topic today. And it's such a, it's one that really confounds um, traditional, the traditional medicine system. So maybe going through a case study there and then, and then kind of talking about, you know, the focus of your book, you know, oxygen under pressure of how hyperbarics played such an important role in the resolution, you know, through synergy, through the stacking of um, different treatments um, and helping to resolve. So kind of weaving together inflammation, getting into okay. mitochondrial function, um, bringing in a case study around autoimmune um, disease, and then weaving in the, the hyperbaric, which is, you know, you've got your company, um, HBOT USA, and we'll provide links and all that kind of stuff at the end of the sure. conversation. But how, did, how does that sound in terms of a flow? Sounds great. Okay. So we'll start with kind of inflammation and, and mitochondria and how that system can get mucked up. Okay. So, uh, and in the book, I have some, some, I don't know if they're diagrams, but little pictures to kind of help, you know, guide people through this, but ultimately, uh, longevity is beyond the highest it's ever been. Right. So generally speaking, humans are living longer. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Centenarians, you know, hu- uh, humans that are hundred years or older, it's like one of the largest growing percentage populations. And so to see longevity reaching these heights, I think is an amazing feat. And we could, we could attribute that to a lot of things, primarily uh, sanitation and you know, just being a, a cleaner environment and taking, to some degree, taking better care of, of, our, uh, of ourselves in terms of um, tr- like we have better trauma care, right? So the, the reasons that people uh, or the reason that longevity was so challenged for so long was basically uh, trauma and infections and, and sanitary conditions that were led to consequences in our health. So the fact that we have you know, better treatment for those types of issues has allowed us to express you know, closer to what we should be expecting, which is 100 plus years of life. The issue is that now we're in a place where, yeah, we're not dying from infections and trauma because we can handle a lot of those things. Uh, but now we're basically, uh, the, the new epidemic basically is chronic illness, uh, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, cancer, uh, autoimmune conditions, you know, all of dementia, uh, you know, all of these are, 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 are basically chronic inflammatory diseases. You know, once a, once a human is exposed to really high levels of inflammation over long periods of time, systems break down. And then that's really where genetics comes in, you know. You, I can't say that we're so, you know, I I do not believe in the genetic predisposition for disease as much as, you know, the genetic makeup may show us where our weaknesses are, but we still need to have these triggers that ultimately set them off. And so this is the, the world of, you know, genetics, I guess, versus epigenetics. So, you know, the genes tell us, well, this is how your body is, and this is how your body is going to respond to a certain, uh, environmental trigger but it's not like the disease is a guarantee just based on the genes themselves. So, you know, if, if we're all chronically inflamed, but my weakness is in my brain, I may show up with dementia. And if somebody else is their weakness is in their pancreas, that person may get diabetes and somebody else, it might be in their gut. And so they end up with Crohn's or colitis. So, but the idea is that chronic inflammation is it's ubiquitous in our environment, in our society we, between, you know, uh, the food that we're eating, toxicity that we're exposed to, uh, medications that we may or may be on, uh, the chronic stress in our lives emotionally, 
there's so many sources of uh, inflammation being allowed to build up in our body. And we don't necessarily, uh, for many of us, have solutions to make sure that we're creating an environment internally that allows us to uh, rid ourselves of that inflammation as it's building up or prevent some of it from building up in the first place. And so that's the idea. The idea is that chronic illness is certainly skyrocketing. Every year, you know, these illnesses are, you know, increasing time, you know, even with some of the best traditional, you know, medicine efforts. Uh, and so uh, we're looking at this as what can we do now to, you know, shift that, uh, that phenomenon that we're seeing in health. So that's the chronic illness, I guess, cascade. Ultimately, uh, there's a there's a part of our cell called the mitochondria. Some people might be very familiar with that. Some people might not. But basically, the mitochondria is a little organelle inside of every cell, and that the the job of that organelle primarily is to create energy for the cell. And so each cell needs energy in order to do its job. So a liver cell needs energy to detoxify us, or uh, you know, help recycle hormones. Uh, an intestinal cell needs energy to absorb nutrients or help get rid of waste. You know, a heart cell needs energy to continue to pump. Your brain cells need energy to continue to send signals. So without cellular energy, that cell type can't do its job. And so one of the issues is that this chronic inflammatory uh, cascade that we were just talking about, ultimately, one of its major effects is it inhibits mitochondrial function. So it starts to downregulate our mitochondria's ability to produce energy. And if that's systemic, then a lot of our systems start to uh, show signs of dysfunction or ultimately fail. And, or if it's in with, with one specific cell type, we may only see changes in that particular um, system or organ. And so what we're looking for is we're looking for what are the ways to break that chronic inflammatory cycle and heal from it. And what are the ways that we can help improve mitochondrial function so that we can reestablish normal cellular energy so that our systems can make the energy that they need to perform whatever task we're asking them to have. Is that a good start? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I have a couple <laughs> of fun nuggets here, but yeah, I'll just, I'll just, I figured summarize. I'd pause yeah. there and no, it's and, good. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, I, I'm a very positive person. And so I think it's important for people to realize that I'm going to just underline the idea that longevity is more possible than ever. And in in we can live yes. well, you know, past a hundred years, but it does require some preventative action to put out the fires of inflammation. Right. So that's what you're right. talking about. Um, I'm also going to highlight the fact that inflammation downregulates the mitochondria, which are the, you know, the powerhouses of our cells and listeners can <laughs> they can go back to their textbooks and look up the right. Krebs cycle Ninth grade bio, that produces yeah. the ATP and all that good stuff. <laughs> yep. So yeah, so it's about the mitochondria being in awesome shape. And I know that, you know, that hyperbarics plays a role in that. And I actually didn't realize until I read your book that, that it had, you know, I've been more of a photobiomodulation gal myself, sure. um, but let's kind of talk about the, like this, cause you actually, you, it was, it's really great in your book. You're like photobiomodulation or red light therapy is awesome but I'm not going to talk about it here in the book because there's only so much you can focus on in a, you know, in any given you know, piece of material. So then you move right into hyperbarics. And so let's, let's kind of go there. How do they help? To, um, how does that modality help to put out the fires of inflammation and boost the mitochondria, which is really kind of like this recipe, you know, putting out the fires and boosting mitochondria, this recipe for this longevity of like, you know, vi you know, having this vision of us like being a hundred years old and out and right. hiking and skiing and doing what we love to do. Yeah. So I want to, I want to just also highlight mm -hmm. the fact that while chronic inflammation is absolutely an issue today for many people and mitochondrial dysfunction is absolutely an issue today for many people, my point in starting the story with longevity is to say that it's very possible that not only can we push the limit of longevity in this moment, the way we are, but that, right now quality of life is is not on par with longevity and that's really where we see that being the issue is that we could live a long time right now however our last 15 or 20 years based on statistics at this moment you know are not as fabulous as they as we deserve them to be or as as they could be as they should be and if we take these steps that i'm talking about we could see that we could start to see a matching between quality of life index and longevity 
where now all of a sudden it's not, you know, because some people like cringe, like, oh, 100 years old, I don't want to do that, you know, because they, in their mind, they're picturing what a sick 100 year old person looks like versus, you know, we all know people who are, you know, 60, but act and feel like they're 40. And we also know people who are 60 and act and feel like they're 80. So there's such a clear difference between, you know, an age is just a number and how we feel and how we function is really what we're looking for. And so if we could push longevity and maintain quality of life, which I do believe is absolutely possible, then all of a sudden hundreds like, wow, I could actually still function and still go on a hike or a bike ride, or I could still drive and, and, and do all the things I want to do in my life and enjoy those years versus, you know, what we, a lot of us have in our mind is that there's just this decline of our, you know, quality of life over time. There shouldn't be. So, um, and that's what this is all about. This is all about what are those things that we can do to basically uh, shift what we're seeing out there in the world in regards to our health. So back to the mitochondria, I just want to cover that a little bit deeper. So the mitochondria's job is to make energy and there's just there's a lot of steps in that process. And it's really, you know, to nerd out on the mitochondria for a few minutes is, is to really understand, uh, which, I, you know, I love that. So it's just to really understand how complex that little part of a cell actually is and, and how much influence we can have over it. And so ultimately, if you think of it, it's, it's end result is to create energy and you have to put in the right raw materials and the factory has to you know, all the parts in the factory have to be working properly. So um, to start in the beginning of that, there's a fuel source. It needs some type of fuel to go into the mitochondria in order to run. And historically, we look at it as a glucose thing. And glucose is, is, a, is a major energy source for the production of ATP. But it doesn't have to be. Our bodies can run on glucose. They can run on fat. And they can run on ketones. And so all of a sudden, you know, you start hearing different things out there you know, in terms of, you know, intermittent fasting and ketosis and block fat, you know, there's all kinds of different things, different diets out there, whatever, but understand that we're eating so that we can deliver a fuel source to this thing whose job it is, is to make energy. So we can influence the function of the mitochondria just by changing our fuel. When we change our fuel, we change mitochondrial output, which means we change energy. So uh, understanding that concept and understanding that uh, every time we make a decision to put something in our mouth, we're feeding the function of our body. And we need to be aware of that and conscious of that because there's absolute benefits and consequences depending on which decisions that we're making right from, the, right from that point. Next, there are certain nutrients that make the mitochondria run better. So if we're deficient in some of those things, then all of a sudden, so, so certain B vitamins, certain uh, minerals like magnesium and calcium. So uh, there, there are certain uh, absolute, just like the plant, there are just certain absolute nutrients required for the function of that mitochondria. So in addition to what we're actually eating, we may choose to supplement in certain ways to make sure that we're, all the raw materials that are required for energy production are there and functioning properly. And then there's a few places where we could really critically influence mitochondrial function besides that photobiomodulation is one of them. So that's why, you know, that's why I brought it up in the book, because again, the book's about oxygen, but it's really about chronic inflammation. So when we put the right raw materials in, and then we stimulate the right machinery along the way, that's the end result of making that cellular energy. And so uh, red light, very specifically, in addition to so many things, right, red light helps reduce inflammation, it creates, you know, a nitric oxide dump, it you know, it, it has all kinds of uh, amazing benefits for us. But one of the things it does is it stimulates a, a, a thing called cytochrome C, which uh, helps us move electrons in the mitochondria. It's, it's one of the rate limiting steps of energy production. So if we're dumping in the right raw materials and we're stimulating the rate limiting steps properly, we can maximize each mitochondria's energy performance. So the right fuel, red light is a rate limiting step and oxygen is a rate limiting step. And so ultimately when we dump the right fuel in, we're using photobiomodulation and we're exposing ourselves to uh, prop, minimally proper oxygen exposure, but also occasionally hyper oxygenation, increasing our oxygen levels periodically. That, that plan is, is a very comprehensive approach to uh, mitochondrial function. And so 
you know, like I said in the book, you know, I focus the book specifically on the oxygen piece because there's a lot written on fasting and ketosis or, or different diets and how we can influence our fuel to influence our system. There's a lot of, not a lot, but there's a handful of books out there on red light and photobiomodulation and the effect of our, of light. You know, the idea that we're light sensitive, just like that plant, right? Mm -hmm. For different reasons and in different ways, we require certain light uh, is not good for us. And we should limit that like blue light and, and certain light is really good for us and we're not getting enough light, red light and infrared. So creating balance in our light because we're very light sensitive creatures and making sure that our oxygen is in check. That's kind of the, the, the big picture with really uh, getting to the bottom of improving that whole chronic inflammation cascade and improving uh, mitochondrial performance. I love it. Yeah. I mean, it's basically like, instead of going to a doctor for uh, a prescription, we should go um, to a doctor slash educator slash author, if we want, um, for the optimal raw materials that you're talking about. And I love how it's like this plant metaphor is like so powerful in our conversation, because then it gets into like plants require the oxygen and light, just like human beings require the oxygen and light. And then you talked about like the hyper, right? So a lot of oxygen, which is, you know, which is kind of the the, the genesis of, of your company and having these um, portable units where people can go and get hyper, you know, barrack, I guess, is, is pressure, but it's right. you know, they can get a hyper dose, a large dose of oxygen in a, in a setting. And, and I will tell listeners that I tried out the units when I was at this conference uh, less than a week ago, and it was really cool. I thought I was going to be a little claustrophobic, but it was awesome. Um, so so we, we, will, we will shift because that, you, like you said, your book mentions some of the other raw materials, but then kind of dives down into oxygen. So kind of like how you did the educational piece around mitochondria. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you dive more into the specifics about oxygen and then sure. the, the hyper aspect of it? So, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when we talk about nutrition, it, my background was exercise physiology before this. So I kind of came from a place of, you know, optimizing, I think in the first, you know, just that's how my, my brain works. And from, from, from that, I got into uh, clinical nutrition. Uh, so then I look at everything, you know, through that lens. And so what that really has brought me to is the understanding that light is also a, it's a nutrient. Oxygen is also a nutrient. And so even though we don't swallow it or chew it or eat it, they are delivering nutrients, required raw materials that our body requires. So, um, I say that because, you know, if oxygen is a nutrient, we have to look at it that way and treat it that way. And so uh, when I lecture on oxygen, uh, I always, I compare it to vitamin C a lot. So, you know, vitamin C, just random vitamin, but if you don't get enough vitamin C, there's consequences to that. So we call that scurvy. And so what we try to do is we try to get at least the minimum amount of vitamin C, right? The RDA is kind of like the minimum amount of a nutrient that you need to not express an illness. So you would certainly want to get the minimum amount of vitamin C to not get scurvy. But people who are aware of that might even say, listen, I don't just want the minimum amount not to get an illness. I want the optimum amount that I have enough vitamin C to do all the different things that vitamin C does in my body. And then even once I'm getting the optimum amount, I might still periodically choose to mega dose vitamin C because I have a cold or a flu or uh, God forbid cancer and I'm going to do IV, you know, vitamin C. So all of a sudden, you know, we have a, a range of uh, a deficiency. Then we have a minimum amount that's appropriate for, you know, normal function. Then we have an optimum range and then we have a reason to still mega dose periodically if we're trying to deal with some type of you know, health issue or just boost our system a little bit from, from time to time. And so oxygen, I look at very similarly. If you're not getting enough oxygen, there's consequences to that. That's called hypoxia. And so all of a sudden, if you have some level of hypoxia in your body, that's an area in your body that's literally starving for oxygen. That could be because we have a heart or a lung issue. And so we're not getting enough oxygen in. And so that would be a, a systemic hypoxia, but it could also be local. Like uh, with an autoimmune, let's say a GI autoimmune disease, because of the chronic inflammation, because of the breakdown of the capillaries and the, the microcirculation, all of a sudden that area in our gut becomes inflamed and hypoxic. Or a trauma, an accident, you hurt something, you bang something, 
uh, TBI, you bang your head, you get a concussion, same thing. Trauma to the microcirculation leads to hypoxia in an area. And the thing is, is that our bodies need, you know, when we go to the doctor sometimes or, or if you're in the hospital, they put that thing on your finger, a pulse oximeter. So that pulse oximeter is measuring the percentage of oxygen that your body's capable of carrying. If we don't have any lung or heart dysfunction, we should all be about 97 or 98% saturated, which means we only have room for like maybe two or 3% at most increased oxygen carrying capacity. So we literally need almost all of the oxygen that we could possibly carry every minute of every day, you know, just for you and I to be having this conversation. So the, the optimum range of oxygen is 98% saturation. And the thing is, is that we still might need, like if you're 98% saturated and you had some sort of, let's say autoimmune disease or traumatized tissue, you're already carrying all the oxygen you can. You can't get a little extra to go feed, you know, this system or this tissue that's suffering. And so that's where hyperbaric comes in because hyperbaric, because of pressure, hyperbaric means increased pressure. But the reason that when we breathe, we absorb oxygen isn't just because there happens to be oxygen in the air, it's because the oxygen that we're living in is under pressure. We have, a, we have an atmosphere. I'm in New Jersey, we're at sea level. So there's a, there's a certain pressure of air that we're surrounded by all the time. And that pressure allows us, when I breathe in, that allows the oxygen to actually get into my system. And so when you increase that pressure, you could increase the amount of absorbed oxygen when you breathe. Just like when you decrease the pressure, which would be the equivalent of going to Colorado and, and let's say being on a mountain at 8,000 feet, it's not that there's less oxygen. The percentage of oxygen of air is the same no matter where you are. It's 21% everywhere. But because there's less pressure at altitude, there's less pressure driving the oxygen in. The air is thinner at altitude than it is at sea level. Likewise, in a hyperbaric environment, you're going below sea level. So because you're going below sea level, you're actually increasing the pressure of oxygen or of air. And that's what's allowing you to absorb even further amounts of oxygen. That's the only way we have right now to quote unquote, like mega dose oxygen. In order to get that higher level of oxygen, the 98% saturation, we need to be able to ex expose ourselves to increased pressure. And that's really where this tool fits in that model. I love that. I mean, to make it super simple, it's basically like hyperbaric oxygen therapy is equivalent to like mega dosing on vitamin C, right? If so if you're low oh. on oxygen, right, and you want to stop that cascade of inflammation and dysfunctional mitochondrial, uh, you know, dysfunctional mitochondria, you can add oxygen to, to kind of do the mega dose um, in exactly. order to, um, to give your body that, that what it needs to kind of be at that optimal level. So, so because we don't have a ton of time and I want to make sure to leave time at the end to direct people to your website and your various companies and your practice and, um, and your book, and I'll put all the links in the show notes, but, um, I promise people kind of a case study. So we don't have to go super deep, but like, say somebody came to you with an autoimmune condition. And of course there's going to be other things that are going to be um, synergistically added to hyperbaric oxygen therapy. But to give people an idea to do that mega dose, like what does it involve? How do they, you know, how is it sequenced? How do you, I know it's, you know, we don't have a ton of time to get into the details, but just right. very simply, what do people um, expect and, and what are some of the um, cases you've seen or examples that you've seen of how this really, this mega dosing helps? Sure. So uh, to, to summarize some of it, there are a handful of Again, physiology. So every cell in your body, basically, except for red blood cells, requires uh, oxygen to function properly. And if it, it's exposed to increased levels of oxygen, there's a certain series of events that happens uh, basically every single time. And there's certain ones that are short term, like so after the first session, these things start changing. And there are certain that are long term. It's not until you get 20 hours, 40 hours or more ultimately that, that certain things start to change. So just to summarize some of that, some of the short-term changes, immediately your body recognizes the increased oxygen. So you could increase the amount of ATP, the cellular energy we were talking about. So as soon as you start getting more oxygen, because it's a rate limiting step in ATP production, you immediately get increased levels of energy production. 
for, for cells. That doesn't necessarily equate to us feeling super energized. It just means your cells are energized so that they can perform their function better. Um, we get certain antioxidants released, so especially superoxide dismutase uh, is, a, is a big one. Uh, you get a reduction in inflammation. Uh, so right away, the body starts uh, identifying the fact that the oxygen is there and starts making certain changes associated with that. The long-term effects are a little bit more significant. That's where the immune system starts to change. So you get increased neutrophil and macrophage activation, which means you could literally fight infection uh, better. Uh, it starts to change the microbiome. So you know most of the pathogens that attack us are anaerobic. They can't handle high oxygen environments. And most of our probiotic, the good bacteria that live on us, they actually prefer high oxygen environments. So it's like we're literally feeding the good bacteria while also making it very uncomfortable for the bad, the pathogens, uh, the bad bacteria that live there to, to, to continue to thrive. And then uh, that's where we start to get increased uh, mitochondrial size and density. So because we have all this extra oxygen, the body recognizes that it's trying to adapt so that it becomes even more efficient at using the oxygen that's available. We also get angiogenesis. So we start to get uh, changes in our the microcirculation that's damaged begins to heal. And that's the critical, for, for chronic inflammatory cases like dementia, concussion, autoimmune, that the damaged circulation is the most foundational issue in terms of getting that person to promote a healing response. If it can't get oxygen, you can't start healing, period. And that damaged circulation is what's blocking the oxygen from getting there. And so hyperbaric oxygen, because it's dissolved in the plasma, the liquid of our blood, all of a sudden, the perfusion, the amount of oxygen available and the ease of the oxygen to get where it's going is so increased. That's where uh, a lot of that sort of magic happens, so to speak, in terms of being able to really all of a sudden initiate the beginning of a healing response in tissue that's been chronically hypoxic for whatever period of time. So in terms of uh, a therapy, you know, it depends. There's different amounts of hyper oxygenation for different conditions at different times. So uh, depending on what the issue is that a person is going through, often uh, frequency matters. So when you go into the hyperbaric chamber, it hyper oxygenates. And when you get out, you start to lose it. And when you go back in, it comes back up and you start to lose it again. So the idea is if this is baseline, you want to hyper oxygenate. And before it gets all the way back down, you want to do it again. And so you basically try to maintain a higher than normal oxygen level for some period of time. That's really where you start to get uh, the compounding effect of, of the oxygen and the healing response associated with that. So for many times it's you know, somewhere between two to six hours a week uh, for four to six weeks at a time as an initial course of care in order to get those levels high enough, maintain that long enough to really get that healing to occur. After that, it, it kind of depends for some people there's no need for like a maintenance dose, so to speak. And for some people there is. And so, you know, a degenerative disease, let's say like dementia, you might be very aggressive initially because you're trying to have a pretty big change in brain function, but dementia is also degenerative over time. So you can't just let it go. Otherwise it's, you know, the function will start to go. So once you get the changes you're looking for, then you look for like a maintenance dose to try to keep it that, in that place. That versus let's say a, um, a TBI or a concussion where that was an injury. Once that heals, unless you want to continue to use oxygen as an optimization tool, as a performance tool, once the issue is healed, it's not degenerative. So you get to keep whatever results you got from that process. So that's really the big difference. If it's, if it's a chronic illness uh, and there's, it's not going to heal completely, then there may be some type of maintenance protocol afterwards. And if it was a trauma or an injury that just needs time to physically heal, and once it's done, it's done then there's not necessarily a need for continued care afterwards. Well, that's a, a very helpful explanation about the, the dosage, right? Because two to six hours a week is a lot, right? Yeah. And so I, that kind of like, okay, that's the aha moment for me for why you uh, created the, um, you know, the HBOT USA Corp. And if you have a couple minutes to go over, we can kind of go sure. into that um, sort of the aha moment for the creation of that company. And we can talk about that. And then, and then maybe kind of conclude with the aha moment for the book, right? And then sure. we can wrap it all up with, with links and so on. But just the fact that you talked about, you know, the two to six hours per week um, would lead one to think, okay, how do I get access to this modality? And then in the book, you talk about your experience, you know, when you were at that conference, right. and I think it was something like eight hours that you spent um, in those chambers there. So, I'm, so that's a good thing for people to, 
realize this or as they're listening to this episode is like, okay, that's how it's used. There's a little bit of an intensity required depending on the condition. And right. so that um, I'll let you kind of take it from there and how that led to the creation of, of your new company, or I don't know how new it is. You sure. can tell us. So, uh, so I had a neuropathy years ago and did my thing that I normally would to try to heal it. And it wasn't responding that that's the story that I tell in the book. So, uh, and in that conference that I had first come across hyperbaric, I did about eight hours over the course of about four days. Uh, and that's where I got about 20% recovery in that neuropathy. So that's when I bought one and started treating myself and kind of go from there. Um, ultimately, you know, once we started using it, not just for myself or my family, but we started using it clinically and starting to, there were, you know, this was 12 plus years ago. Uh, there weren't a whole lot of protocols available. We didn't really know what we were doing. We've basically built a lot of those uh, over time. Uh, in treating patients, and now that there are more people doing it, in you know, in in terms of collaborating with other providers who who, who use similar tools, and be able to build a little bit more of a specific uh, protocol base around a lot of these different conditions. So, but in in all cases, there is some degree of commitment for sure. It's you know, a little bit of oxygen is great, but if you're needing to rebuild circulation, if you're needing to rebuild. Uh, mitochondrial function and reduce inflammation at the levels that a lot of people do, that doesn't happen in three or four hours. It happens in, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, you know, it really just depends on the severity, right? The, the intensity of the therapy has to match the severity of the case. So less severe cases require less, obviously, and more severe cases require more. And, you know, some of the reason to have, you know, these portable units, it comes to that. There are not, you know, we, we, we operate a clinic in New Jersey, uh, we also operate a hyperbaric clinic in um, outside of Philadelphia, and then we we team up with other doctors, helping them to build clinics. So we have another one uh, in San Antonio, we have another one outside of Chicago, and we're continuing to build those relationships because ultimately it's really difficult, unfortunately, still for patients to find these therapies. Primarily, a lot of them exist in hospitals, but hospitals won't treat any of these conditions. So hospitals have you know 14 different diagnoses that they treat, and they will not treat anything other than those. And those are reserved for very serious issues like gangrene and osteonecrosis and osteomyelitis. So, uh, you know, very severe issues, not these chronic issues. So private clinics like ours are clinics that can choose to treat these, you know, sort of you know, non-insurance dependent uh, indications. And there just aren't that many yet. And so while I prefer in many cases for patients to seek out clinics, where where that's not an option to be able to have a therapy like this in your own home. Uh, now they're not as strong at home, so you know oftentimes what you're what you what you may miss in terms of pressure and oxygen uh, that you would get in a in a clinic that you're using at home, you could make up for with frequency and duration. And so because it's more convenient because you have it in your home, you could do as many hours as you need to because it's convenient and it's in your home. So as long as you're committing to the process, uh, in so many cases, the home therapy, if it's your, especially if it's the only option, because there is no clinic, uh, we can create protocols to um, simulate, you know, a similar scenario that, that you would get in a clinic by manipulating the duration and frequency versus the pressure and oxygen. So, you know, so I guess for me, the aha moment was, you know, this is a very powerful tool. It, it, uh, there are things that we see in our clinics every day that, you know, virtually should have been impossible to see. Um, and it's an amazing thing to watch uh, people heal and people come around. And especially, you know, for, for us, like when we see kids that have, you know, unfortunate chronic issues um, to see them turn the corner and, and to change is, is, it's very, it's meaningful. So, um, you know, realizing that and realizing that they're, they're just so hard to find these clinics, you know, we really wanted to build a model where either we could help patients get access to this directly, or we could help doctors understand it better, that they might choose to actually start to use it in their clinic so that we could treat more people. And so HBOT USA does both of those things. HBOT USA helps patients get direct access to home therapy units. And HBOT USA teams up with other clinics to try to implement hyperbaric oxygen within their clinics so that they could also be treating you know, their own patients. There's no shortage of necessity for this tool out there. Um, it is very, very effective. It's one of the safest things that you could also do. So, so many times we have to, as doctors, we're weighing the risk reward benefit. 
you know, this is a very risky procedure, but you know, the, the outcome could be great, but the consequences could also be great. This isn't like that. This is a very, very powerful therapy and the, the, the risks are exceptionally low. I mean, almost negligent. So there, there's almost no uh, side effects or, or, or consequences to uh, properly implemented hyperbaric oxygen. So to me, it's a win-win. It's patients are getting access to something that's amazing that they need. Doctors are able to offer that at a level that is effective and safe. And so, you know, it's just a win for, for everybody involved. The, sorry, just the quick, because you had mentioned the aha moment on the book was the same thing, because I, I find that there are so many myths and misunderstandings and misconceptions about hyperbaric oxygen still today. And, you know, I have conversations with very brilliant doctors, but there's still this barrier of misunderstanding. And um, it's not, you know, it's not out of malice. It's not that it's, you know, it, it's just a total misunderstanding. So I wrote the book because I needed to get these messages to people who could influence these decisions. So ultimately, if I want the doctor to implement hyperbaric oxygen in their clinic, they need to be very aware of the benefits, the consequences, all these things that we're talking about today. And, and so really that book was a, a labor of, if I could educate doctors to understand those risks, but really to understand the benefits and to understand how to implement it so that their patients whether they chose to at least refer patients to clinics so that they could at least get the therapy or if they actually decided like hey I should offer this either way it increases patient access to a to a tool that right now is still just so far limited compared to the way it should be I love that. And I love like really understanding the why behind uh, a book journey because books are, you know, there's so much work and so much time yeah. and a huge, um, yeah. a, it's a huge part of your resources that you're dedicating to a project. So you, so the why of sort of um, creating influence and education in the, in the world kind of leads us back to where we all started, you know, with the doctor, educator, author. Well, it also led you to be an entrepreneur, kind of add that um, you know, a uh, descriptor to the list of things that you already do and starting HBOD. And I'd love for you to, because I love the fact that you are educating doctors and you're providing more access to something, to a modality that will help so many people. So I'd love for you to talk um, about how people can find, you know, the links to the various places, whether it's coming to your clinic in New Jersey or finding doctors that, um, that have the system in their office. I mean, there's probably so many places that people can go. So I want to make sure to give the time appropriately to um, allowing people to follow up. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so our, our main clinic in New Jersey, there's two parts. There's uh, core therapies that you mentioned before. So that's core therapies.net. Um, and we, you know, we also, the hyperbaric is kind of a separate entity within that same, but it's in the same place. Uh, and the website for that is, um, oxygen NJ or New Jersey spelled out New Jersey HBOT. And then uh, we have uh, PA HBOT, we have uh, San Antonio HBOT, Chicago HBOT. So all of those could be, uh, could be checked out if, if somebody happens to be close to one of those. Um, and uh, HBOT USA, so HBOTUSA.com is sort of the main site for, for a lot of our hyperbaric work. Uh, it's kind of like the umbrella of each of these little uh, clinics underneath it. And um, the book is on Amazon. We also have a YouTube channel, uh, which is also just HBOT USA. So we have about probably 50 videos on various topics and we put out like two or three new ones every week. Well, gosh, maybe it's all this oxygen that's allowing you to be so productive to do all be, this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's amazing. That's very impressive. I'll get all the links in the show notes. And, um, and I right. think it's important for people to understand that there's your clinic in New Jersey. There's probably, depending on when people are listening to this, if they're listening to this in some future date, there could be places all over the country or world um, where they can gain access to this technology, to this modality. And also, Absolutely. you know, for people that you know, have an acute system, and I'm sure this is going to be our acute um, situation, and this is going to be evolving over time. There is this um, idea for home use. And then the book is just sort of an easy entry point into, into learning about it. And, you know, what I've done, Dr. Jason, is when I've really been passionate about, um, about a, like, way back um, over 10 years ago, I gave my doctor a book on SIBO. 
before anyone was really even talking about it. Mm -hmm. And he read it. So it's like, sometimes a book is just sort of a beautiful piece um, where it's, it's kind of like, you know, you know, something that you can hand to somebody if they're interested in learning more about it. It's such a great um, educational piece. And so whether people want to do it for themselves, or maybe they want to bring it to their doctor, to a functional medicine practitioner, to chiropractors, um, and they can find out more information um, at your HBOT USA site about what you're doing to to work with people, because I know that's a very important part of your mission is to, is to, is to bring this to more people. So people have access. Absolutely. Exactly. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your inspiration. Again, for me to see what a little bit of extra oxygen can do, <laughs> maybe I in terms could, of you producing. Could, you could write six books, you know, treat patients all day, travel all over the place and go to conferences. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you for your inspiration and for all that you're doing for the work. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much.